so excited to be here today. Um, I'm a Zen practitioner, and the spiritual community in Buddhism is called a Sangha. And I think of all of the participants at Franchise for Humanity as my Sangha of activism. So it's just a real pleasure. I want to start this off by asking the same question that I ask the girls when I do my multimedia events, which is how many people in here can name five parts of your body that you love? Got a few hands. OK. When I ask this question to an auditorium of hundreds of 14 and 15-year-old girls in Vancouver on Tuesday, a single hand went up in the room. So we're going to be talking today a little bit about why and a little bit about what some of the answers to this travesty might actually be. This is what I saw the other day when I walked into Barnes and Nobles. Cover of Sports Illustrated. On a kiosk on its own, 25 different versions of the magazine. But what was even more discouraging for me was to watch the six-year-old girl who was in line holding the hand of her mother, gazing onward at this image. And I thought to myself, how do you respond to this when you have a six-year-old daughter? So I asked my sister, who has a six-year-old daughter, how would you respond to this? And she said, I don't know. So I asked the counselor at the school, I said, what would you tell your daughter? And she said, I, I don't know, maybe I'd tell her that this woman has to pee? <laughs> <laughs> to say nothing of the fact that here we have yet another body part for women to fixate on that they have to fix. Notice the fully waxed Brazilian that this model is featuring. But what is perhaps even more troubling is that we lose this model. This image is dehumanizing. Gone is the fact that she was valedictorian of her high school class. Gone is the fact that she was a tennis champion in the Virgin Islands. She is reduced to the sum of her parts. No, she did not apply to the scholarship to Stanford University. And she is not here with us today. This was her choice instead. Studies show many young girls would rather be sexy than smart. Perhaps that is because we live in a culture wherein girls are presented with a choice, be hot or be invisible. And if you talk one-on-one -on -one with any teen or tween girl, the answer is clear every time. Invisibility is not a choice that they want to make. Young women, girls are more afraid of getting fat than they are of cancer, nuclear war, or losing a parent. But to bring a little levity to a topic I'm very passionate about, we can listen to the words of Tina Fey, who perhaps said it best, every girl is expected to have Caucasian blue eyes, full Spanish lips, a classic button nose, hairless Asian skin with a California tan, a Jamaican dance hall ass, long Swedish legs, small Japanese feet, the abs of a lesbian gym owner, the hips of a 10-year-old boy, and doll tits. This is why everyone is struggling. If you Google on the internet right now the most beautiful woman in the world, you will meet Christina. She's nine, and she has been coined the most beautiful woman in the world. Meet Tilan Blondeau, formerly featured on the cover of French Vogue magazine. Please notice the plunging neckline, the gold stiletto heels, and the bonding cords around her ankles. She's 10. Obviously, we do not present our women the way that we present our men in the media. If I were to show you just the top shot of, of these two images, there would probably be no response. But generally, when you see the bottom image, it can bring up a bit of a giggle. And our storylines also play a part in promulgating this messaging. There are many similarities between the messaging we find in Beauty and the Beast and the messaging that we find in the Hollywood blockbuster release, which broke records, Fifty Shades of Grey. But young women are not only being groomed to think less and buy more. They're not only being groomed as consumers, they're being groomed to relate to themselves and their bodies as commodities that can be bought and sold. We have a generation of pop stars that dress like sex workers. Miley Cyrus's VMA Awards show performance figuring prominently in this discussion.
And this is why this is a problem. And this is what I say to the girls, because they want to be sexy. They want to be sexy so badly. But why do we have to have this conversation around sexual objectification and self-objectification? Because when we self-objectify, which is characterized by things like body monitoring, chronic attendance to appearance, makeup, thinking about how other people are perceiving you when you're walking down the school hallways, what they're thinking about your cankles or your muffin top or your thigh gap, which are popular trends that have emerged in the land of conversation around female bodies. The problem with self-objectification is not only that it's dehumanizing, but it is also that it leads to decreased condom use, decreased sexual assertion, okay, and increased body shame, increased depression, and increased disordered eating. Hospitalizations for eating disorders have increased 119% for children under 12. Between, two th between 1999 and 2005. And this, on the far end of the spectrum of mental health issues, is how it can actually look. This was an image given to me by a young woman after a talk. She had this piece of paper crumpled up in her hand, and she said, can I show this to you? I said, sure. She said, this is my eating disorder. It turned out she had been out of school for three months, running around her living room compulsively, trying to burn calories. This is me clawing at myself. This is my self-hatred. This is my fat, slothful body. These are the chains that I feel bound by. Okay. This is me falling apart like the pieces of a puzzle. And these are the voices that I hear in my head. So when I show this image, when I'm doing a talk, and this is not Love the Skin You're In, this is another opportunity to sort of talk with an aerial view about the, these issues that are facing girl culture. Um, I ask the girls, how does this make you feel? Which is what I ask them often when I'm showing them the imagery that they're being presented with, because what ends up happening is this imagery has become so rampant and so normalized that they get disconnected from their own emotional response to it. In fact, the only response that we're seeing, for the most part, is I want to be that, and I want to do whatever it takes to actually get there. What is this ad selling? Any guesses in the room? What could this be selling? Yeah. You got it. She's selling an anti-aging, anti-cellulite cream. The ad is directed toward 50-year-old women. And how old is the model? She's 14. So they take a 14-year-old body, they airbrush it, enhance it, they take two separate shots, they wrap the ribbon around her waist, they take a grown woman's hand, and they paste it on her lower back. So the question, will we awaken from our cultural trance? Because essentially, that's what we're in, and that's what we're training our young women whose voices and leadership are absolutely quintessential to solving the world's problems. This is what we're teaching them. So I like to unpack this question from two different places. And I think that this quote by David Loy is a, is a good uh, a good expression of that. The path of personal transformation, the path of social transformation are not really separate from each other. We must reclaim the concept of awakening from an exclusively individualistic therapeutic model and focus on how individual liberation also requires social transformation. Engagement in the world is how our personal awakening blossoms. So as someone who spends a month out of every year doing nothing but sitting on my cushion, walking mindfully and eating, um, I can attest to the power of personal transformation. It has been unbelievably powerful. But what I really want to talk about today is systemic change. Meet Venus of Willendorf. I don't think Venus of Willendorf is thinking about how fat her thighs are. Okay, all we need to do is look at Rian Eisler's work, for example, an, an amazing, amazing, uh, illustrious writer who went back 10 and 30,000 years to research where did peace prevail? When was the time that we actually had 
a sustainable planet. And what she found was that the sustainable planet went right alongside an equitable planet. In these ancient goddess-worshipping cultures, the female body was seen as a site of life and light and rejuvenation, inseparable from the earth from which all of the food sprang. Yesterday, Peter generously placed this question before us. How do we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest amount of time through spontaneous collaboration without disadvantage to anyone? I don't think we can begin to answer this question without pluming the roots of who is disadvantaged. And I don't think we can look at the disadvantaged until we examine the fact that 70% of the world's poor are women and children. Katul Hayuk, an ancient culture in Turkey, enjoyed a thousand years of relative peace. And I also want to point out with, that this was a model that worked for everyone. This wasn't about matriarchy as the opposite of patriarchy, because matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy. Partnership is. And what they found is that when women were given equitable status, everybody thrived, all beings and the planet. The status of women and girls is a stronger predictor of a nation's long-term economic success and quality of life than the GDP. So rather than giving endless money to weaponry and war and prisons, why don't we talk about new social wealth indicators like the environment, like childcare? It ultimately all comes down to what we choose to value and where we place our dollar.